Dr. Lopez, you're muted. Just a minute. Okay. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, no, as I was saying, thank you very much to Nassim for her presentation and to the Bashir Elahis for hosting this event. It's always a, a pleasure to be with you on a Friday evening. Um, and uh, the title of tonight's presentation, as you have seen from the invitation, is Economic Governance in a Post-COVID-19 World. Um, you know, it's interesting, but uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, I have had the opportunity to participate in at least, I don't know, three, four uh, events, some of them actually quite large. Uh, one of them on June the 30th was um, with uh, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, and uh, with Mr. Martin Chongdong, who is the uh, Executive um, Secretary of the Interparliamentary Union in, in Geneva. And it's an organization that is over 100 years old that brings parliamentarians from all over the world to discuss uh, you know, common problems. And I'm really uh, very heartened by uh, the extent to which people are thinking about you know, how the world is changing as a result of the current crisis. Uh, and I'm especially heartened by an increasing willingness on the part of the public, uh, government officials, people in civil society, you know, to question some of the most fundamental assumptions of the last 100 years. So this is a very fertile period. And, and what I like to do tonight is just share with you uh, some of the things that I have heard or some of the things that I have said in, in these discussions. Um, I think this is inherently a very interesting, very fascinating subject. And it is a, also a dynamic uh, debate as we move along, as time passes by, as we internalize the consequences of the pandemic, um, we are discovering that our own thinking on the subject is evolving very, very quickly. And I think that this is really very promising. But let me begin by saying that, uh, it's saying a little bit about the economic crisis itself. If we're going to talk about economic govern governance after the crisis, then we need to understand a little bit the context for the crisis today. Um, that will make the second part of my presentation a little bit more meaningful and, 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 and uh, uh, um, hopefully interesting. So let's talk about the crisis today. And I will do this uh, by sharing a few bits of information. Uh, I am an economist after all, so you will have to bear with me. But, but whatever information I will give you will will be important for laying out the background, you know, the context for what comes afterwards. You know, the IMF came up with uh, some statement uh, a couple of weeks ago saying that the current economic crisis is the most intense, most severe crisis that we have experienced in the last 150 years, with the exception of World War I and World War II. In other words, if you look at peacetime, or what is called peacetime, um, this is the, the most severe crisis in, in the last uh, century and a half. This is saying a lot. It's saying a lot. And just to give you some sense of the numbers, you know, the, the, the previous most intense crisis we, we had was in 2008, 2009. The global financial crisis began in 2008, but the worst year in terms of economic performance was 2009, because that is the full year impact of the, of the crisis. In 2010, the global economy was already in a period of recovery. And if you actually look at what happened to economic growth in 2009, you will find it difficult to believe, but I assure you the numbers are right. Global economic growth in 2009 um, contracted by 0.1%. 0.1%. So you might immediately say, well, how is that possible? How can we talk about global financial crisis you know, if the economy, in fact, uh, contracted virtually nothing, was essentially flat in 2009? And the answer to that is, well, you know, if you actually, that's an average for the whole world, uh, it turns out that the crisis was very asymmetric. It was very intense in the United States and Europe in what are called the advanced economies, where where the economy, the economy contracted by something like three and a half percent, but there was actually economic growth in the rest of the world, in the emerging markets and the developing countries of something like 3%. Today in 2020, the crisis is dramatically different. 
it was minus 0.1% in 2009. Uh, this year, the latest forecasts from the IMF say that the economy in 2020 is going to contract by something like 5%. And for that, there is no precedent in the last many, 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 many decades. Um, and this minus 5% is actually re reflects a reduction everywhere across the planet. The advanced economies, that means the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, you know, the, the high income world will, will contract by 8% and the emerging markets, the developing countries by something like 3%, all right? So enough for numbers. Um, so this crisis is much more intense and um, it has also been much faster in, in, in the, the way that it has hit the global economy because of its very nature. The crisis has been precipitated by the need for people to, to, to basically go into quarantine, the lock, what's called the lockdown. Um, that has brought economic activity to a complete standstill very quickly and has had very dramatic implications throughout the world. Just to give you an example, the International Labour Organization in Geneva issued a report about six weeks ago, I would say, saying that um, one, 1,600 million people, I mean, that's a huge amount, 1,600 million people who are working essentially in the informal economy. These are people who don't have regular jobs. They depend on day-to-day -day trading. They, they are selling, uh, 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 you know, items in, in open-air markets throughout the developing world in Africa and Latin America and so on. These 1,600 million people have seen their incomes re reduce somewhere between 60 and 80 percent, literally overnight. Right? Uh, and so this is very, very dramatic. Um, um, you don't see it too much in the United States because, because informality in the United States is, is uh, uh, relatively small in relation to, say, Africa, Latin America. And of course, the United States, as you know, and other countries, especially in Europe and so on, have implemented huge packages of assistance to their populations to mitigate the impact and, and to protect people from the from the from the uh, rigors of the of the of the economic calamity. Um, also, because of the highest degrees of integration of the of the global economy and you know sort of our hyper connectivity. This, this economic contraction has had kind of multiple ramifications you know, across a whole range of areas. Now, let me just mention one of them. Um, immigrant remittances. This is money that is sent by workers, very often informal, very often illegal, uh, in countries like the United States, like Europe, like the high income countries, the monies that are sent back home you know, to Latin America, to Africa, to, to South Asia. Immigrant remittances this year are projected to contract by something like 20%, which in dollar terms is something like $100 billion. So this is money that flows to the poor countries that is not going to come this year. Tax revenues have collapsed because economic activity has collapsed. The prices of export commodities for many countries have, have fallen, and, and, and that means you know, export receipts have fallen, and so on. Um, now, Many, when, you people, when you ask people, you know, what are the causes of the crisis? Why has this happened to us, right? Very often people will simply say, well, the crisis has been precipitated because governments have basically forced people to stay home, um, the lockdowns, the quarantine. And at, at, the, at, at, a kind of a, at an initial superficial level, this is true. But I think we need to dig a little deeper um, this is kind of the proximate cause of the crisis, but you know, there's a deeper, deeper reason for this crisis. And it fundamentally has to do with, among other things, the very aggressive, very pervasive way in which we human beings, homo sapiens, are invading the habitats of animals um, that carry viruses against which we don't have immunity. Right? You know, and this is a, an ongoing process. The United Nations estimates that by 2050, the, the population, the world's population will be somewhere between nine and 10 billion people. Today, it's like 7.7, .7, let's say. So 
for these two, uh, two, two billion additional people that are going to be born between now and 2050, um, we have to build roads, we have to build them houses, we have to expand our agricultural land so that we can grow food, so that we can feed them. Not only that, but actually all of these people already living today expect their standard of living to be higher. So they expect to consume more. They expect, they expect economic growth to be positive in coming years, right? And this is putting huge pressure on the environment and on, 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 on the, the, the places that traditionally throughout history have been the habitats of animals, bats and other creatures that, have, that carry viruses against which we have no protection. Right, and the reason I want to make this point is because is because um, the scientists are saying that these vi these viruses, these coronaviruses, and other other such viruses, are are going to are going to become more or less a permanent feature of our future. In the last twenty years, we have had SARS, we have had MERS, we have had Ebola. Now today, we have COVID nineteen. And you know there could be well other others coming, and for that reason, this sense that we don't lack that we lack protection against these these calamities is that people today are asking themselves, what does this mean for our future? What sort of changes do we need to make to our global economy? How do we need to manage our our economic governance in a way that protects us from what is happening to us today? Because this crisis has caught us completely by surprise. Well, I take I take that back. There is a there is a a, a, a YouTube video of Bill Gates in 2015 predicting and saying that exactly what were happening today was going to happen soon enough, right? So it also reflects, in fact, a, a failure of governance because we were not prepared for this for this crisis. All right. Um, so having set the background. Um, let me then go on to the next part of my presentation, which is basically, you know, how should the system change? What does the crisis tell us? What are the lessons that we can glean for purposes of making changes to our economic system so that we're not caught by surprise every, every few years? And so that we don't have to bear the very heavy costs that we're bearing today. And I don't just mean Fiscal costs, I mean the cost in lives, the cost and the disruption to people's livelihoods. All the, all the things that we're seeing, we're seeing throughout the world today in, in, you know, with such high, high drama, right? So here, what I've done is I've done a list of nine things. Um, 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 nine, the, the, the magic number, all right? And you know, I, will, I will address these you know, briefly but I think that these are these are all very very important part of the solution. Some of the, the 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 ideas for some of these you will find in the Baha'i writings, and where appropriate, I will I will tell you where and how. And other things have emerged simply because of you know the the, the way that the, the the world has evolved and the particular you know structure of features of the global economy today. So the first thing that should be obvious to you is that we need to strengthen our health infrastructures. Um, I think that what the crisis has revealed is that, is that um, we, for this kind of calamity, we are totally unprepared. And I'm not talking about the poor countries in the developing world, in Africa and Latin America, which obviously have very dilapidated, very inadequate health infrastructure. I'm even talking about the large industrial countries, the high income countries, you have seen the strains that were put into the, in their systems in Spain, in, in Italy, and here in the US as well, where the crisis has been especially, especially intense, as you know. So I don't need to repeat the things that you have already seen in the news here, but obviously, you know, this is one area where there is a lot of soul searching going on. Um, uh, the Spanish government about a month ago did something which I think should be copied throughout the world. It established a commission of experts and it asked these experts to issue a report telling the government um, after a thorough examination of the health system, you know, what it is that we need to do in order to empower us to confront this crisis, this type of crisis in the future in a more effective way 
that doesn't lead to so much disruption, that doesn't lead to much human suffering, so much fatality, so much infection, and so on. Uh, in other words, they are taking a step forward and saying, this is going to come again. We don't know when. Um, uh, it, could be, uh, it could be just as bad or even worse, and so we need to prepare for it. So that's one area. Um, incidentally, um, uh, of course, this is something that as a Baha'i, as a Baha'i economist, if you could say, you know, I, I, of course, fully support because the, the writings of the Baha'i faith, the writings of the founder, as you have heard me say before, are full of these statements where the founder uh, encourages government, uh, governments, rulers and leaders to essentially protect the downtrodden, to protect the interests of the poor. He very much uh, establishes a linkage between the quality of the of government on the one hand and the extent to which governance is ultimately reflected in improvements in the, in the, in the life and the quality of life, especially of the poor, the vulnerable, um, you know, as Baha'u'llah characterizes the downtrodden. Um, so this is one, one important area. The other one, which is, I think is, is relevant in many parts of the world is that, you know, we need to increase the coverage of health insurance and, and paid sick leave. Uh, you, you know, in, in, in Canada, in, in Germany, in Italy, and France is not an issue because health coverage is universal. It is not linked to one's employment. It is a right of citizenship. It is something that you get whether you work, whether you don't work. Um, there is a safety net that protects everybody in a time of, of illness. This is not the case everywhere. Here in the United States, you have tens of millions of people who are not, who don't have access to health insurance and who therefore are very vulnerable. And, you know, we tend to see this issue as a, as a, a kind of a issue of uh, finances. Uh, but I think, I think that, um, that that perspective is a little bit limited. And I will come back to that in a, in, in a few minutes and I will share with you a kind of a different, different perspective. Um, remember, uh, remember, I keep coming back to this, uh, to this statement of Baha'u'llah to Edward Brown in 1890. Uh, I guess partly because I'm an economist and, and I tend to see things very much in terms of uh, you know, efficiency and resource allocation and how limited resources can be better used if they are deployed here instead of here, wasted here, right? And, and I think that what this crisis is showing is that we need to be much more savvy in, in countries everywhere, including the United States, in terms of how we spend our resources. You know, governments collect tax revenue and then they deploy this tax revenue for different social, social ends, to, to educate young, young, young people, uh, to build infrastructure, to protect, uh, to provide pension payments and other forms of, of uh, protection and so on, right? And of course, to, 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 to uh, uh, spend on the military and so on and so forth. And, and I think that very often we did this kind of automatically, you know, we, we don't really think very hard, you know, are we spending the resources correctly? Uh, are we getting the best benefit out of the revenue that we are collecting through taxes in terms of benefits for society, for everybody? Is the money being spent in a way that creates equity in society or is the money being spent in ways that basically favors one group at the expense of other groups and so on. And, and, and it seems to me that to improve the quality of governance, we need to be uh, doing a lot more critical thinking about the priorities of, 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 of expenditure. Maybe we should not be subsidizing uh, energy and making climate change worse. Maybe we should spending more on education uh, to empower our young people, to train them to empower them to, to operate in a very, in an increasingly complex global economy, right? Um, you know, not all countries can spend their way out of crisis uh, like the United States is doing now or like the Europeans are doing. You know, these are large economies. They have the capacity to deploy huge resources. Uh, poor developing countries in Africa and Latin America and other parts of the world don't have that capacity. And therefore there, the issue of how you prioritize your spending is, is very, very important. And Baha'u'llah said to Edward Brown, 
he lamented and he said, we see your rulers and, 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 and kings spending their resources more on that which will destroy mankind than in that which will be conducive to the happiness of mankind, right? In other words, more money on weapons and rifles and other things that will ultimately be used to kill other people and not enough money on boosting education, boosting health, boosting infrastructure and so on. Um, you know, um, I, you have heard me say this before, but I think Baha'u'llah understood the importance of, of equity, the importance of effective governance, the importance of honesty and integrity in the use of these resources, and the need to constantly question whether the way we're spending our resources is, is good and is, uh, is effective in terms of promoting social well-being, prosperity, and, and, and welfare. Um, for me, I'm going through my list, um, we need to address the kinds of institutional weaknesses which the current crisis has, has shown. Um, you know, at, at this event that I participated with uh, former Prime Minister Helen Clark from Sweden, New Zealand, and the gentleman from the Interparliamentary Union, I think it was Helen Clark who said that the COVID-19 crisis is nothing more than than the anteroom. It is nothing more than just the first stage of what is coming in the future through climate change. Right? It's a it's a kind of a a warning to us that unless we begin to act uh, differently, unless we begin to take much more proactive measures in, term, in terms of questioning our system of governance, we are going to be hit much harder you know, with, with climate change than, than the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, let me give you an example of what people mean when they, when they talk about this. Um, the classic example is uh, the Paris Accord on climate change in 2015. You know, in December of that year, 175 heads of state came together in Paris to agree on some uh, emissions targets. Uh, but the system has been a complete failure, the agreements. Uh, not to say that the event itself was not important and many people applauded and there was a sense of uh, achievement because at least it was a recognition on the part of governments that yes, we have a serious problem and we need to do something about it, right? But the targets that were agreed were, were, were uh, completely voluntary. Um, the scientists were saying that even if everybody, everybody does what they have promised, which of course they will not do, um, we're not going to prevent a, an increase in temperature of two degrees centigrade. And in fact, what has happened since 2015 is that emissions have gone up every year, every year, every year. And so this is one example of an area in which the policies that are being implemented, the cooperation that is taking place at the, at the international level is just not working. It is not working. Right? We are worse off today than we were in 2015. So it's a replay of the Kyoto Protocol of the 1990s, which also was a calamitous failure. It was nice uh, public relations, but it did not address the problem of climate change. So unless we sort out this, this problem in some fundamental way fairly quickly, then, then essentially, you know, we have lots of uh, crisis coming our way. You know, Shoghi Effendi said something brilliant in 1931 in, in the, the goal of a new world order. And it, it remains so relevant uh, today. He, he was referring to, you know, remember, the, place yourself to, in the historical context. This is the height of the Great Depression, right? And so he's, he's, he's talking about the causes of unrest in the world, the satisfaction and happiness, the sense that, you know, the world is not going in the right direction. And he says the reason, the primary cause of unrest today is that the institutions, the political and economic institutions that we have, have failed to adapt themselves to the needs of a rapidly changing world. How true, how true, how insightful. This, he wrote this before even the United Nations was created, right? And yet it characterizes the last 75 years of the United Nations in a brilliant, very accurate way. That is exactly what has happened. In 1945, we created a new world order around the United Nations, and that world order has basically remained frozen in time. The UN Charter has never been amended. When the UN Charter was approved, literally 75 years ago, 
uh, that in fact, I participated in an event on June 26, which was the, the 75th anniversary to the day of the signing of the UN Charter, um, has never been amended. The UN Charter makes no reference to nuclear weapons. The UN Charter makes no reference to climate change. It does talk about poverty. It does talk about, about uh, uh, peace and security, but the main challenges that we face today, the existential challenges that are threatening our future, like climate change and nuclear proliferation, are not part of the UN Charter because they were not in the radar screen at that time. And so this is one area where, where unless we do what Shoghi Effendi is saying, namely to adapt our institutions to the changes that have taken place in, 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 in the meantime, you know, we are going to basically be uh, working with institutions who are completely inadequate to the task that we have before us. Right? Now, let me move on. Uh, I'm looking at my watch. Uh, let me move on and say that um, one idea that is present in the writings of the faith, especially Abdul Baha, uh, as he was traveling around and talking about, you know, creating a, a new economic and, and social order is the idea of, of basically providing individuals as a, as a, as a, as a birthright, uh, not linked to their jobs, but simply as a birthright, simply by virtue of having been born into this world, you know, a kind of a basic minimum set of, 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 uh, of uh, um, uh, income um, that would, would be, you know, that would uh, finance a kind of a minimum standard of living, so, so, so to speak, right? And, and the, 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 this idea has a great deal of appeal today, but when Abdul Baha was talking about it, you know, more than a hundred years ago, you, you know, it was completely revolutionary. Right? And the ethical, the ethical underpinning of this idea is really very transparent and very compelling, and, and essentially comes from an argument that says that we should create a system in which um, your future as an individual, your ability to fulfill your capacities and to become a, a productive member of society should not be linked to the nationality of your parents. Um, that it should be something that is independent of something that is after all a purely historical accident. We don't choose who are our parents. If our parents are Norwegians or Swedes, you know, we are rich and prosperous and we live to a long, long sweet age. If our parents come from Sub-Saharan Africa or from Haiti or from some other very poor troubled country, you know, we are likely to uh, uh, die early. We are likely never to fulfill our, our, our full capacities. We're likely to be part of the 820 million malnourished individuals in the world. And this is, there is fundament, something that is fundamentally wrong with this, with, this, with, this, with, with this system. We take it as given, we take it as a fact of life. Um, nobody has ever, you know, I've worked in the World Bank for many years. Before that, I worked in the IMF for many years. You know, nobody has ever questioned the fairness of the current system, whereby if you're born in Africa, you're destined to be poor. If you're born in, in a high income country, you will, you will most likely you know, have a very pleasant life, at least in terms of material, material satisfaction, right? But, but in the Baha'i faith, we do think that this matters enormously. When Abdul Baha was traveling in America, he did say, we need to create an economic system that eliminates poverty altogether, permanently, forever. We should, have, we should not have poor people in the world. People should have access to basic necessities, to, to health, to education, to, to uh, income so that we don't, we don't go mal malnourished and so on. And I'm glad to say that this idea is making a comeback. You know? In the past, it was dismissed as pie in the sky. People talked about, well, um, it's unaffordable and uh, it's going to create an underclass of people who are just going to stay at work, uh, stay at home and at work and so on and so forth. But all those, those, those uh, conventional conventional uh, beliefs are being questioned e every, every day. And, 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 and I think that that is a very good sign, a very good sign. And at least speaking for me professionally, it's an area in which I am speaking more and more directly, more and more candidly, um, questioning the, the old traditional um, ways of thinking and what has been 
being encouraged, very, very encouraging to me was the extent to which people are responding to this idea. Um, um, I, I won't go into the details because we don't have the time, but, but uh, just take it from me. It's a very encouraging development. Um, there is another reason why we would want to do this beyond the purely ethical dimension, which is that you know, we, should, we should not have uh, poverty in the world. We should not have people who, who, who don't have enough nourishment in the early years of, their, of, of, of the development of their brains so that uh, the, their IQ is, in, in, is uh, impaired or that they will not be able to, to fulfill their capacities as a human being, right? But beyond that, there is something that has to do with our own self-protection. It is something that we should favor because what this pandemic has shown is that, is that nobody is exempt from contagion. You know, these pandemics are sort of equal opportunity risks. Everybody is affected. Heads of state have fallen, uh, rich people have fallen, and of course the poor as well, especially if they are li living very congested urban environments. And so as long as there are people who are infected, everybody is at risk. And therefore, we would wish to create an economic system in which the extent of protection is much more universal, much more, much more um, widespread, because that in itself is, ins is insurance, you know, against, against contagion or against other problems, you know, for everybody, for everybody. Um, and so this is, in other words, there is an element of self-interest here. I would wish to have an economic system that provides greater security to all because that would be a protection for me as well. If we have an economic system that, that is ultimately creates a, a, a huge number of people who are vulnerable to pandemics and other kinds of uh, uh, ills, then that will come back to haunt the, 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 the health of the rich countries and all of us. Because this is one of the consequences of being hyper-connected, of being highly integrated. We, are no we can no longer isolate ourselves from, from, from the impact of these, of these, uh, these uh, um, um, uh, crises and these pandemics. Let me share with you to conclude one more item, one more idea, uh, which is very close to, to our faith uh, and which has to do with gender equality. And then let me conclude also with two quotes, um, uh, which address you know, some of the ideas that I have touched upon tonight. Um, you know that I'm gonna share with you some really fascinating statistics which have come out just in the last couple of weeks. And just bear with me, it's very simple, but very compelling. Um, you know very well that the majority of the world's leaders are men, right? That's well known. In fact, only 7% of the 193 members of the United Nations are currently led by women, right? Uh, I'm talking about Angela Merkel in, in Germany. I'm talking about Mrs. Yassern in New Zealand and, and, and so on. 7%. However, when you look at the whole world, and as you know, by now, COVID has basically hit everybody. Um, when you look at the whole world and you divide the countries of the world in those countries that have more or less successfully dealt with the, with the COVID, COVID-19, and those countries that have been less successful, it turns out that 40% of the successful cases are in the hands of women, are being run by, by women. The Germanys and the Norways and the Icelands and the Finlands and the Taiwans of this world, right? So they make 7% seven, seven of the world leadership, but they account for 40% of all the successful cases of having dealt with the, with the coronavirus. In fact, one more statistic. Um, if you look at the mortality rate in those countries that are run by women and those countries that are run by men, the mortality rate in the countries run by women is six times lower than the mortality rate in the countries run by men. This is a shocking statistic. So there is something in the way that women are managing this crisis that, that, that we could all learn from, right? And it's interesting to think about it, to speculate, you know, what is it about the way that women are, are, are managing this that is it's sort of make, is making a difference? 
Well, I, there are things that come to mind. Um, women are, uh, are uh, using approaches based on science and empirical evidence, not on, not on you know, some kind of harebrained theory or some, 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 uh, some other uh, 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 a policy that has no underpinning in science, that they have tended to prioritize human security and socioeconomic well-being instead of, you know, the a traditional milit militaristic approaches to national security, which men are very distinguished for, and which has caused so much pain and, and, and death in our last 100 years. Um, women, uh, when you actually look at what they have done in some of these countries, uh, Germany, New Zealand, Taiwan, Finland, Iceland, etc., you see there is a great deal of emphasis on inclusiveness, on transparency, on flexibility. You know, uh, uh, flexibility is very important. You need, to, you need to be able to access to the best science and need to change course on a day-to-day -day basis if necessary. You cannot be wedded to crazy theories or, or ideas that, 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 that basically have no basis in science. And so what am I trying to get at by sharing these statistics with you? That that it comes back to the idea of the faith, Abdul Baha uh, uh, saying in Philadelphia that not until women have been empowered, not until they are sitting at the table participating with men in the, in the, in the, in the, in the most important economic and political decisions, will the world see peace, will the world see prosperity, will the world see stability, right? In other words, we're coming out of an era in which the world has paid a very heavy price for the marginalization of women, for the discrimination against women. And it is absolutely clear, becoming very, very clear that as long as we don't allow women to govern and to join the men in the governing of our nations, in finding solutions to the global problems, we are going to be paying a very, very heavy price. And to me, this is perhaps one of the most enduring lessons that will come out of the, out of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, women may in fact be part of the solution, not just to, 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 to pandemics, but to climate change and to many of the other global problems that we have today. Let me finish by sharing with you two quotes, which I think highlight in many ways, um, uh, in, in, in many ways, you know, some of the important underlying principles that, that should be part of the, of the solution. One comes from one of my favorite German uh, philosophers, psychologists. I'm sure you have read uh, things by him. His name is Eric Fromm. Um, he was born in Germany in 1900 and lived, you know, during the first 80 years of the 20th century. He died in Switzerland in 1980. He said the following, and for the, for the Baha'is in the audience, I think this will resonate very powerfully as you hear. He said, I believe that the one world which is emerging can come into existence only if a new man comes into being. A man who has emerged from the archaic ties of blood and soil and who feels himself to be the son of man, a citizen of the world whose loyalty is to the human race and to life rather than to any exclusive part of it a man who loves his country because he loves mankind and whose judgment is not warped by tribal loyalty. I'm sure that Eric Fram also meant women. He's using the, the word man in the generic, meaning humanity. But for me, he, he captures in a very powerful way the concept of the unity of mankind, which I think is, the, is going to be perhaps the enduring lesson of COVID-19 and climate change and much of what else what else is coming our way. And then I want to conclude by reading another quote for you from uh, The Promise of World Peace, which is um, a document um, issued by Universal House of Justice, the world governing body of the Baha'i Faith in 1985 on the 40th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. They ask, the time has come when those who preach the dogmas of materialism whether of the East or the West, whether of capitalism or socialism, must give account of the moral stewardship they have presumed to exercise. What is the new world promised by these ideologies? What is the international peace to whose ideals they proclaim their devotion? 
Where are the breakthroughs into new realms of cultural achievement produced by the aggrandizement of this race or that nation of, of a particular class? Why is the vast majority of the, of the world's people sinking ever deeper into hunger and wretchedness when wealth on a scale undreamed of by the pharaohs, the Caesars, or even the imperial powers of the 19th century is at the disposal of the present arbiters of human affairs? So this was a way in which the Universal House of Justice in 1985 was basically questioning the very foundation of our economic order. And you know, in a way, it is sad to, it is sad to, to observe that it has taken um, you know, 35 years and a, cal a, a calamity of this nature to, to finally perhaps begin to awaken in, in the leadership in, in, among scientists, among economists, you know, the idea that that basically we need to rethink uh, economic governance in a very, and, and other forms of governance as well in a very very fundamental way. Otherwise, there will be a very heavy price to pay in coming in coming years, and we certainly would like to avoid that. Thank you. Wow, um, uh, it's really every time that I hear Dr. Lopez, I tell myself I'm so lucky to be in this community really that I can have the friendship and advice of this truly citizen of the world, the gentleman that is really belongs to this citizenship of the world really. And thank you enough. I can't thank you enough, uh, Dr. Lopez really for several things. Uh, one of that he knows that whenever I call him, he is ready to really come and help us. Uh, and that is wonderful. I appreciate that very much, uh, Augusto. Really, without much ado, I'm gonna pass it to Alex. He's gonna open the things to, uh, for questions and answers and anything else that comes up, comments. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. And thank you for your enlightening talk tonight. As always, you encouraged us to learn more about the global economic situation, and especially in light of COVID-19. Um, as Dr. Bashir Lahi mentioned, we'll now transition to the Q&A portion of the fireside. Uh, as Dr. Bashir Lahi mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, uh, please make sure for your Q&A topics tonight uh, that they're relevant to today's conversation. Obviously, there are many different things that we could speak about tonight, uh, but if you could just dial them in and target them to uh, uh, tonight's conversation, uh, then we'll be sure to make them productive. I see that in the chat already, we have uh, questions pouring in. So I'll go ahead and read the first one from uh, Bob from Maryland. Uh, or uh, Bob, if, you're, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, you can read it yourself if, if you're capable. Uh, yes, I'm interested in whether or not the leadership, sex of the, of, of the leader of a country is the thing that makes it successful at handling these crises, or is it the strength of the society that can elect a female as a leader is the thing that makes it more successful? Yeah. You know, I think what has happened in many of these countries is that, of course, um, they have made great progress in empowering women economically, politically. They have cleaned up their legislation. They have eliminated all kinds of discrimination. And, uh, you know, nobody's, nobody, no, no, there is no country in the world that has, re, that has completely eliminated the gender gap. Even in the Nordic countries, you know, that are the most advanced in terms of achieving, achieving uh, or giving women opportunity and empowering them, you still have gaps. Um, for instance, in the job, in the job market, the labor force participation rate of women is still lower than men everywhere in the world. There is not a single country for which the, 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 the labor force participation of the sexes is the same, right? Uh, you have countries like Germany and Denmark where the gap is six, eight, nine, ten 10 percentage points. You have countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia where it is 50, 60 percentage points, right? The labor force participation rate of women in Iran, I think is 15%. Mm -hmm. So one out of every eight women is work, is, is, uh, of working age is actually working. So these countries that have that have empowered women and that have that have essentially created the conditions for her to integrate herself into into all spheres of human endeavor, 
increasingly are feeling very comfortable with the idea of putting them in positions of great responsibility, like, like you know, being the chancellor or the prime minister or the head of state. Right? And so um, I think that what I, I is ultimately responsible for good management of COVID-19 in the cases of Germany and the other countries that I have mentioned, New Zealand, et cetera, is, is the kind of approach to problem solving that women have brought to, to, to the table, right? Um, I mentioned some of those characteristics. Um, I think inclusiveness. I think that putting emphasis on, on sort of uh, so, social protection and, and human welfare, um, seeing, the, seeing uh, that, that um, you know, sort of scarce resources need to be used effectively um, being able to follow the best scientific evidence and advice. Right? In other words, don't approach the problem with prejudices and with pre preconceived ideas as to what works, what doesn't work, but rather surround yourself by expertise and follow the, ex the advice of the experts who really know about epidemiology and what to do and what not to do. Right? And that, I think, ultimately accounts for the success. Now, those qualities are not inherent to women only. Men can follow scientific advice as well. And there are many cases, in fact, 60% of the cases of successful management of the COVID are from countries led by men. My point here is that, is that you know, women have special capacities and skills. And to the extent that in many countries, those are marginalized through discrimination, through prejudice, through cultural taboos, those societies suffer. They suffer because that talent does not get channeled into, into the finding solutions to the problems and into management of the economy or, 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 or the country more generally. Right? Well, the, the thing I'm interested yeah. in is the, being an elementary school teacher, I'm used to being led by women. And, and, and it's a good thing. And you're right, they think differently. But what is it about the societies that recognize this? And what can we do to make our society more acceptable to, to electing women or getting people who are, who are in power that, what, what do we have to do to change our society to make that work? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, I think, I guess we need to, by, uh, to the extent that we give women opportunity to shine and to acquire positions of importance and responsibility, societies will begin to see the benefits of doing that. Right? You know, we have a kind of a accumulating body of evidence that, for instance, suggests that having women sitting uh, in positions of importance in the business community, for instance, in the boards of corporations, is very beneficial for the corporation. They are less prone to corruption, less prone to corporate governance scandals. They have a, a greater ability to retain the loyalty of the staff. There is not so much turnover and so on, right? So as we internalize the benefits to society of, of, of the, the participation of women, people will begin to wake up. They will begin to realize, hey, you know, we should, we should vote more, more women in the office. Um, we should we should empower them politically, uh, you know, more, more more rapidly, as some countries are doing through the introduction of quotas, right? So so I think that that's part of the part of the solution is that we need to we need to by giving them more opportunities, you know, we will we will see more rapidly the evidence of the benefits of of their participation, and this will begin to change consciousness and change uh, people's prejudices. What, what about those countries that have... We the next, shall we go to the next yep. question? I see that there are several others as well, just to give opportunity to others. This is one last question, though. What about well, we have... Uh, ...by women. But I, I sincerely women, apologize. There's uh, something different about them as well. Uh, Bob. Uh, and I'll get I off the list. apologize, yep. Go. We'll, we'll certainly circle back. Uh, we want to get to make... We want to make sure that we have, you know, everybody equal chance to ask a few questions here. Uh, the next question goes to Neil Porter, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, thanks for a great talk there, Dr. Lopez. I was just thinking, I know you said that you were heartened by um, the receptiveness of um, the certain folks to these new new ideas, but I was wondering that since we're not in normal times, 
do you fear that um, these favorable views will fade um, once uh, these, these favorable views to these progressive ideas will fade once things kind of return to normal? <laughs> um, you know, there may be, there may not be a return to normal, actually. Uh, maybe there, maybe there will be a return to normality in terms of COVID-19, because uh, I think the scientists are saying that by the end of the year, early next year, we will have a vaccine. And, uh, and that, you know, is going to help us sort of gradually resolve this issue. But, but the problem itself, the underlying problem, which is lack of immunity to animal viruses, that's not gonna go away unless we take a much more fundamental, more radical uh, approach to climate change, to human population growth, to urbanization and so on, right? So, so um, no, I, I, I frankly, this, this has both a positive and a negative feature. A, a negative feature obviously is that crises are not nice. They bring costs, they bring suffering, they, they, they lead to dislocation and, and, and uh, you know, a great deal of distress in many parts of the world. On the other hand, they highlight our weaknesses and then they provide an opportunity for us to do something about it. Right? Uh, and that's the upside, that's the positive side that, that uh, unfortunately we are we have too much inertia to do things because they seem the right thing to do. We only do them because we have no other choice. We're up against the wall and there is no other way and then we do them. Thank you. Uh, the, nec the next comes from uh, uh, my parents. I'll go ahead and unmute them. This is Jane and Rob Kalodner. There we go. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Lopez, thank you very much for, for uh, your presentation. You, you mentioned in your talk that one of the problems uh, with our current habits is that we're invading the animal kingdom, and that's resulting in viruses that we are not prepared to control. Um, in addition, you mentioned that our, our tendency towards a pattern of consumerism, uh, where we're constantly uh, expecting an increase in the quality of life and putting uh, tremendous pressure on the Earth's natural resources, especially as we increase the, the population in, in addition to that. Um, as you know, in the Baha'i faith, we're told that eventually humanity will choose to become vegetarian out of necessity. Do you think we're nearing that time out of uh, necessity to protect the Earth's resources uh, or that we should be moving uh, towards a vegetarian diet as part of the uh, move towards the new world order? Yeah, well, you know that um, um, you're absolutely right. Um, not only not only are we going to have you know nine to ten billion people by 2050, there is going to be, in other words, an increase in the scale of human human action on the planet. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, these people have expectations of rising standards of living, right? So you have two forces at work. You have more people going from say 7 billion to 10 billion, but these people expect to consume more, to have more. Everybody wants to have two cars in China, right? But China has 1.4 billion people and there is no way in the world that we can give two cars to people in China, right? Um, so, so there is kind of growing pressure on world resources and to raise the issue, to, to come to the issue that you raised about you know, meat, it is well known that uh, having meat in one's diet is very intensive in the use of natural resources, water, land, and, and, and so on. And so, yes, I think that people, especially younger people, will increasingly become vegetarian, partly for health reasons, it's healthier, but also partly for ecological reasons, that if you become vegetarian, uh, your footprint, in terms of emissions, is smaller than if you if you are a great meat eater, you know, for which we have to graze the cattle and have to feed the cattle and and, and you know burn fuel to 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 you know, to, to grow the feed to feed them and so on and so forth. Right? So partly part of the move to to increasing uh, uh, to lowering the consumption of meat may be may be linked to climate and a, a kind of a 
the moral dilemma that people will increasingly have. Is it right for me, because of my taste, you know, to put pressure on the world's resources, or does it make more sense to change my tastes, which, by the way, is healthier, right? So it's a net gain, and yet put less pressure on the world's resources. And I think the same will go for, you know, maybe having more economic forms of transportation. Uh, maybe part of the solution is public transport. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, we families should should be content with uh, with uh, uh, less less accumulation of, of material goods. Um, you know, partly with a view to to putting less pressure on, on resources. You remember what Baha'u'llah said, right? He said, if allowed to overstep the bounds of moderation, civilization will prove as a prolific a source of evil as it has been of good when kept within the bounds of moderation. Right? Mm. Very, very compelling statement, which I think has probably climate change in mind. If, no, if, there are, if there are no other questions, I am I'm happy to let you go. <laughs> um, Let's, there is just one last question, and it comes from Gary, and then we can, uh, uh, we can conclude there. How does that work for you? Yes, that's perfect. All right. Gary, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for an excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Lopez. Um, my concern is the role of greed in the economy. Uh, we have greed for money, greed for power. Uh, greed is ever present in our society. It's a very uh, big element of the U.S. economy and life. What can we do to eliminate or to at least minimize greed, the lust for power and the lust for money, and still have a viable economic system? Yeah, I think ultimately this has to do with how we perceive the, to be the purpose of life, right? Um, for me, for me, um, the Baha'i writings in this respect are especially insightful and have helped me to come up with a philosophy of life that hopefully um, uh, is, is more sensible, not just for my own future, as, a, as a, my spiritual future, but also in terms of you know, sustainability on the planet. Uh, and basically, Baha'u'llah says in one of his writings, the purpose of all the religions, um, not just the Baha'i faith, but all the religions in the past, uh, is to uh, educate individuals, men and women, so that, he says, at the time of their death, they will leave this world in a state of purity and sanctity and absolute detachment. So he links the purpose of our lives to something that is fundamentally spiritual, which has ultimately to do with the development of our spiritual capacity. He's not saying that the purpose of life is to accumulate uh, material possessions. Um, he's not even saying that the purpose of life is to ac accumulate great knowledge and expertise, although that is worthwhile and it's, it should be encouraged, right? But fundamentally, in, uh, sort of at, at the very at the very foundation of, of uh, the reason for our existence is the idea that we are here to develop our cap spiritual capacity so that when we go to the next world we do it in a state of purity and sanctity. When people internalize that in their daily lives, I think that they will begin to live much healthier lives. Um, they will not feel that they have to have ten television sets and, and four cars. They will not feel that they can. They, they necessarily need to have a, a, a big, a big house when a smaller house would do, and and, and on and on and on. Right? Um, it, you know, ultimately, the pressures on the world's resources come partly from our material, our material, our materialism. Right? The emphasis that we have put in our lives, you know, for material accumulation and and uh, economic economic, uh, you know, well-being. In, in the Baha'i faith, the causation goes the other way. The purpose of life is to develop our capacities so that we will live this world in a state of purity and sanctity. And when we see, when we, when we live according to that purpose, then it follows that yes, we will accumulate knowledge and expertise. Yes, we will work in a spirit of service to mankind. 
yes, we will try to do our very best uh, in whatever it is that we do, whatever our profession, whatever our, 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 our you know, the, in, in whichever way we contribute to society, right? But the driving force of all that is always attaining a life of purity and sanctity. The driving force is not to excel over others. It's not to becoming you know, incredibly wealthy. It's not to accumulate material goods. Right? Uh, we, are not, we are not discouraging people from prospering. No, the Baha'i faith and the Bab and Baha'u'llah have said very clearly that if, a, if, if, if someone can prosper through business, through a trade or a profession, while keeping sight of the spiritual requirements of a holy life, he says that's light upon light. Um, in other words, if you don't allow your wealth to detract you from, from spiritual attainment, then that's the, the, the optimal, he says, it's the best, because he doesn't want us to live a life of poverty and, 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 and need. Abdul Baha was very clear on that. He wants to eliminate poverty permanently throughout the world. Nobody should poor should be poor. Nobody should have life live a life of need and 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 and, and, and hardship and and, and 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 you know deprivation. Okay, my friends, thank you so much for your attention. You are always a very good, uh, very good audience. Thank you, Nasser. Thank you, uh, million, uh, Gusto. Really, it's really I can't thank you enough. As I said already, uh, and we are gonna call you again. This is. This story will continue, and <laughs> I'm very happy about that, really. Uh, right. Rebecca, you have a prayer? Yes. O oh God, my God, aid thou thy trusted servants to have loving and tender hearts. Help them to spread amongst all the nations of the earth the light of guidance that cometh from the company on high. Verily, Thou art the strong, the powerful, the mighty, the all-subduing, the ever-giving. Verily, thou art the generous, the gentle, the tender, the most bountiful. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'm very grateful to all of you that makes this fireside very successful. God bless you all, really. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And in customary fashion, we're going to unmute everybody. You can say goodbye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye now. Have a great weekend, everyone, and keep safe. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. Master John, thank you, and goodbye, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see you, Good to see you all. Gary. Eileen, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you all. Take it easy, everybody. Wow. That's wonderful. Terry, good to see you. Terry, what? Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs>